So maybe I can start about talking about what we're gonna do in the workshop. And I'm I'm really hoping that you got to uh, install uh, all of the required software because it's gonna take you to actually do the job and I will only be here to show you how things are done. I've done these things multiple times by myself, so it doesn't really mean anything if I do the work by myself, but rather it means a lot more uh, if you are actually able to do it uh, on your own. As I mentioned on Slack before, that I already have uh, put up a GitHub page that I will uh, co like continue changing, uh, I, I think, until the foreseeable future. So if you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or if you want me to actually add on to that page, uh, please let me know. You have the Slack. You will also have my email. Um, so I can actually start sharing the screen with you and we can talk about it on on the web page. So let me quickly get back to where I was. So here you will see a bunch of files. And I think the names are already quite self-explanatory, but I will come like just go through them and tell you what they are. But first of all, uh, here is like a quick summary. And I hope you've gone through the uh, installation page. And uh, please let me know if you have any questions or if you are not able to use any of these things. And I really hope that you got to work with these paths. So in each step, you will see that there are some tutorials. Uh, like, for example, for this today, we're going to start working with XMM Newton. And you will see that there are a few steps that you have to go through. And uh, all of those things are actually like, so these are actually corresponding to the comments that you have to use on your terminal. And you, you can easily copy and uh, paste it to your terminal. There will be some differences since I only copied from my Mac to the GitHub page. And when you compete on your own system, it might change a few things like um, like the quotation marks and stuff. So please be aware that uh, that might be a problem. Uh, so if you receive a, like an error, please don't freak out. It's going to be very easy to fix those things. As you can see, for example, for XMM Newton, everything is uh, like you see all of these expressions and how you need to do everything. Um, and to start with, we're gonna we're gonna look at how we can actually find and download our data. So for our uh, workshop here, we're gonna work with uh, four sources. Today, we're gonna actually reduce data for two sources to show you what actually is going to happen with XMM Newton. The first thing that you need to do is if you wanna look at the data and how many observations are available for your source, you can easily go and click on this link, which will, okay, I'm, I'm gonna have to need to, this link will take you to Hesarch's uh, archive. Basically, it's uh, how do you say it? Like managed by NASA, but you can find all of these uh, currently active or have been active uh, instruments that you might be interested in. So for our purposes today, I'm going to search for GeoJ1655 minus 40. So you can just type in the name or you can actually add the coordinates. You can have, if you have, if you know when the observation was done, you can search for the observation date. If you, if you are specifically interested in one mission, you can basically either select what, from one of these, uh, or you can easily just start to search and see what's happening. This is done for like the big majority of the missions, but for uh, two missions, one of them being XMM Newton, which is here, and Chandra, they have their own science archives, which are like a lot better if you want to use all of the interactive tools, if you want to look for a specific observational um, information, but like if you want to know which instruments were active, which purpose was it was uh, it was taken for. Uh, you will also see the um, the proposals and everything. So it's better to actually go and look for them. I will show you how it goes. But if you want to download, for example, like RxDE data that do not have uh, that does not have its own science archive, you have to go through uh, Hesarch's archive. It goes also for integral, although there are a few different ways to actually get the integral data. 
or Suzaku Swift. Um, but for today's, we're gonna go with uh, our XTE. So you will see here there are to in total four columns. The first one is just showing you what instrument that you're using. And these are actually um, basically catalogs that have different that were created for different purposes for our XTE, for example, you will see that there are actually six different things that you can search for. These are catalogs, like for example, this slew data is basically just uh, maintenance, like the, also includes maintenance of the uh, instrument. Uh, you can see the proposals and abstracts. You can see like long mission source catalog, which includes all of the information for your source. But the main catalog we're going to be using is this master catalog. So if you click on the name, you will see what it means. So if you are not sure which one, which one to use from these things, you can just easily click on the name and see what it does. For example, for this one, it's uh providing a comprehensive accurate and easily trackable like all of the observations as you can see from here so what you're going to do is click on this number and you're going to see this page that might take a while for you to load depending on your internet activity how many data that you have on here for example in our case it was 621 observations or something like that you can actually have these things in a different way you can uh redisplay this uh as for example an excel compatible if you want to download it you can turn it into a fits table you can use it as a text table however you want it's easier to work with this table for me at least because i kind of got used to it and or you can actually reorder this table i'm gonna quickly go and uh, as you can see if you wait a little longer on each thing you can see how it's gonna sort your table so you can actually sort everything uh by number however for our xte observation ids are not chronological so if you want to work with a continuous set of data like this for example for uh let's say observations taken in 1996 you're gonna have to download everything and you have to go and actually order everything by the date if you want to have your observation ids uh in a chronological order there are a few ways that you can do it the easiest would be to work with uh python uh, or if you're interested in any other uh, languages i'm going to quickly check the observation id we're going to use for our xte at least I'm only downloading it now just to show you how it's done, uh, uh, but we're going to be working with RxDE later on. So this is the observation ID. I'm going to quickly send it to the Slack chat. So this this is the observation ID we're we're going to be working with. Uh, if you can download it uh, as soon as you can, it would be great. So how you do the download is pretty easy. You can just select either all of the rows or specific rows. I will show you how to do it uh, for multiple rows because it's possible that you are going to be working with multiple sets of uh, data. Uh, so here, if you're working with maybe a couple and you know that the size of your file will going to be is going to be um, much like uh, smaller than two gigabytes, you can just easily go and retrieve. Uh, otherwise, you're going to have to create a download script, which will give you a set of comments that you can run on your terminal. So here is everything that you need to download for your specific RxDE data. I will later on show you what each step actually means i'm gonna go and actually send these to you as as well on um slack but if you can download it by yourself it would be great so that we can start working with it and if we go back we are actually done with everything you, you can see here uh and now it means that you have your data but what happens with XMM Newton is a little different. You can still actually go and download all of these data from uh, XMM Newton, although I have to go and start to search, but it's a lot easier for a specific reason to go and find the uh, 
Science Archive. And you will see why now. So for the download now, I'm going to use LMCX3. So you can see that, that you, like it's pretty similar in terms of like uh, start and end date, duration. You can see you can see why this specific observation was done, who it was uh, the PI for it. Uh, and you can see if it was made public or not. So with XMM Newton, you have to be careful because observations are done on a specific date and they're not publicly released for a year because the PI has the um, basically control of the uh, uh, observation for a year. They can publish as much as they want. And once they're like, once the one year period is done, you can easily go and download the data by yourself, or you can actually directly contact the PI and ask if they will be willing to release it. I have never done it before, so I don't know how people are actually, uh, if their people are actually open to doing it, but just something to keep in mind. So if you see a scheduled observation here, it doesn't mean that the uh, uh, you can actually access the... Um, observation immediately. <clears throat> For our uh, uh, analysis today, let me find, yeah, it's this one. Again, I will quickly send the ID to you. Uh. Of course, it's not going to copy and paste it. If you can, so what it, what you do is that you basically click on this download data and you will see that there pops out a few things. Uh, you can see that spectra and light curves seem to be available immediately. You can actually do those things, but as you will also see in the future that there are going to be specific treatments that you need to consider when reducing the data and <clears throat> specifically for this one observations that you are seeing that we will have to deal with the some of the problems that will come from the source being very very bright if you click on odf it will basically prompt you, i'm not really sure if you can actually see it but it will it will prompt a download uh, window for you and then you can download it if you can go and download it now it would be great and one other source that we are going to be using is LMC X4, and I believe this is the uh, the observation. So if you can download these files as we are talking, and also please let me know if you, if there's anything that you are missing or if you need me to uh, slow down a little more. So for the, for today with XMM Newton, we are going to be using these two sources, LMCX3 and LMCX4. Um, I'm not entirely sure if you're familiar with LMC. It's the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, it's like about 50 kiloparsecs away from us. And uh, they it basically holds quite a lot of X-ray binaries that are very interesting to many. LMCX1 is one of the black hole X-ray binaries that has been used for spin uh, studies of black holes before and on the contrast LMCX4 is a, a neutron star x-ray binary so we will also see how to extract the power spectrum for these sources but we will start for LMCX3 because it has a specific uh, characteristics in the observations that will be very important for you to uh, actually experience yourself uh, I will now go back and continue with other steps after uh, downloading the data. As you, uh, also one other additional information, if you want to download more than uh, like a uh, like a set of observations, or if you actually want to download everything you see here, you basically select the row and add to the basket. 
but you have to log in and have to have an account, which is very easily done. And uh, you can just register yourself for whatever email you want to have. And it sends you the link to actually access these data. I'm going to give you some time for you to uh, download the data. And in the meantime, I will quickly go through what XMM Newton is and uh, what happens, like what, what are the characteristics of this specific uh, instrument. This is actually one of the very first instruments that I got to learn as a bachelor student. Um, it was sent into the orbit in 1999, December, I believe. And uh, it's been still operating ever since it got active in, uh, in 2000. And uh, it was originally sent for, funded for two years and was uh, planned to be operational for 10 years. And it's been now 23 years, which is like an amazing thing. And it's very uh, in, in good condition. And I think if I'm not mistaking the... Uh, the extended period is until 2026. Uh, so we will actually have this uh, amazing instrument still operating for another three years. And uh, who knows what's gonna happen afterwards, but I think we're still looking for a, a bit of more extension if things go well. So it basically has this EPIC camera system, which, uh, which stands for European Photon Imaging Camera. And it has uh, three cameras, three CCD cameras within it. So what CCD means is the coupled uh, charge device. Um, what happens is that as your photon hits uh, the um, the photometric part of it, it generates a specific amount of uh, electric charge on it, uh, depending on the intensity and the location of the light, which then is transmitted into spatial and uh, energy information for your uh, instrument. If you want more details on these, there are tons of YouTube videos explaining the beauty of it. But one interesting thing is that we have all, all of these space instruments, but for some reason, we still have better cameras on our iPhones or on our phones, which is amazing that what we can do is like, with these cameras is much, much uh, more impressive than just taking a few Instagram selfies. So it has three cameras, as I said, one of them are metal oxide semiconductors or MOS, MOS1 and PN, MOS2. And then we also have the PN, uh, PN actually stands for, I think, uh, I, I will send it to you. I don't remember exact the wording, but it also, uh, it, it means that it's a different mechanism for collecting the photons than uh, most one and most two. Uh, we also have this reflection grating spectrometer, which uh, basically uh, uh, like basically gathers all of the all of your light and then uh, creates a grating spectrum for you, which will which we will not be working with today. I will also add a few uh, lines to how to work with our GS data, but for our purposes, we are not going to be using it. Uh, we will only, only be talking about basic reduction for MOS1, MOS2, and PN. So it says the energy range is between 0 0.15 and uh, 15 kV, uh, but the instrument is mostly um, sensitive to 0 0.3 to maybe 10, maybe 12, depending on how high you want to go, because as you go in the energy spectrum in lower energies, if you're working with black hole X-ray binaries, for example, or X-ray binaries in general, where you have the accretion disk, your spectrum is going to be dominated by your uh, accretion disk. And if you go along the higher end, you will have um, higher energy events that will generate higher flux in the photon counts. But one problem with higher energies is that for these specific instruments, uh, the background is also going to be dominating. So you, you need to have to somehow model your background to be able to better uh, extract the regions. So if you don't want to deal with that, you, you can basically end your spectrum at 10, which is like a common practice for everyone, basically. Uh, it, it provides a field of view of, of 30 arc minutes and uh, quite 
okay-ish <laughs> angular resolution, you will see what I actually mean. It will have uh, different operating modes. Uh, you will see the full frame. You, there's also this partial window and there's timing modes, which we will all reduce the data for in the uh, in, in this uh, tutorial. Um, can anyone let me know if you still have uh, to wait for your data to download or we can actually move on with preparing your data? I got the RxD downloaded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm downloading from this uh, Newton, mm -hmm. but I forgot which files we should download, ODF or all of them. Oh. Um, all of them is also okay as long as you have the ODF. ODF stands for the observational data file, so that's mm -hmm. going to give us all of the event files that we need. But it also the other files are just uh, extracted data files by like a certain pipeline. But we need to work with the ODF. Okay. So I'm gonna give you like five more, like maybe ten minutes. I hope it should be enough. Uh, some of these steps, and especially for new star and RXTE, they will be taking quite a while for you to run. So that's why I'm actually hoping that you can do it on your own. Otherwise, I will be doing from my own computer and you will need to do it from your own computer, which will give us like a different processing time. So it's better that we basically go all of through all of the steps and uh, then you can start doing it on your own. Uh, so I can briefly explain what we are we're going to be doing for XMM Newton. First, everything starts with preparing your data. You have to prepare your data in terms of uh, which calibration files you're going to be using, which calibration files are designed for your uh, specific observation, your specific instrument within uh, XMM Newton. And then uh, also another warning, so each step will require you to go through all of these things for MOS and PN separately. Uh, as you can see, I highlighted, like I named this event files with EPIC event. So EPIC means MOS1, MOS2 or PN. So for each step, you will need to change this because I also arranged everything so that it has the naming of uh, the same way for everything. So if you start by changing the names of the original event files to this, everything will be a lot easier. You can also uh, choose to actually go with the original files. I personally do not prefer. But if you see this epic name in one command, you need to be aware that that can that has to be changed. And you will also see these either selection expressions or some other expressions that will be in these. And I also have them listed for both MOS and PN. So MOS1 and MOS2 are the same. So you will only have to change from MOS1 to MOS2, but it will be different for PN. As I told you, it's a different uh instrument basically and uh, here prepare, preparing after preparing the observation files you will need to account for the if filtering for the uh, flaring background as i mentioned in the hard energies you will kind of have to deal with the background and sometimes this background can be um, sort of flaring which means that it's either the solar flares or um there's this specific object in the background is going out bursting behaviors and that you have to actually filter those for those things. Um, so this is like a specific plot that you might be able to see if there's a flaring background. Um, and then if we go down after you clear your event file for those flaring backgrounds so that you don't have to deal with it in the analysis of the um, the spectra and especially light curve if you want to actually look at um, an outbursting behavior in your in your um, in your source so you will extract an image which will look pretty much similar uh, so this is for this is an image for pn you will also do this for uh, most one and most two 
And once you are done with your image, you will go to extracting a light curve and your spectrum, which will both depend on your source selection and your background selection, which are all described in here. Um, here is the extraction of the light curve, and then you will go through extracting your spectra, which are going to be different for MOS and PN um, in one expression. Like there will be only one different difference in extra extracting the spectra, but again, uh, these are different processes technically. These are all going to be done for imaging modes that we've seen here. Uh, where is it? Full frame and partial window. Uh, both actually produce like 2D images for you, for your observation, which you can see like X and Y coordinates and you can actually get your the specific spatial resolution of your uh, the source. But for some sources, especially X-ray binaries that are very close to us and are going through uh, an outbursting behavior, uh, you will have to deal with the effects that come from the brightness of the source. So what's going to happen, as we will see from LMC X3, is that it's called uh, a pileup, um, which means that you will receive tons of photons at the same time, and they will they will hit your chip at the same time. So what will the chip read is that oh, there are two photons. It's it's not going to be able to actually distinguish them from one another and it will see oh okay there's only one photon with the total amount of energy that each photon had so you will actually have your sought photons to be reduced in in uh, in the flux values and you will see an excess in your higher energy uh photons which will definitely shift your spectrum by quite a lot so you have to account for these and there is going to be a way to do it so and i will also going to be explaining what the timing mode actually is doing Here's the pile up. So timing mode is actually, um, how do you say it? Uh, started as a way to deal with these pile up issues. So instead of just taking the 2D image for an extended period of time, it basically starts reading the events as if it's shifting in time. So you will only see one dimension and the, the uh, so your X coordinate is going to be your uh, technically a special dimension, and this is going to be your time dimension. And then we will go and see how to deal with these brightness issues. And then we will go and, uh, I mean, if you want to actually go and take a look at uh, how to deal with, with Python, there are amazing uh, Jupyter notebooks developed by Carlo Ferrigno from the University of Geneva. Uh, I will not actually apply all of these things because as you will see that this is a very extended uh, Jupyter notebook, but I have a similar notebook to be reduced for the purpose of our workshop this week for Newstar. So maybe we can even give it a try. Uh, okay, maybe we can wait a little more for the data. I think I have it all downloaded. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So when you see, uh, so this is going to be all uh, compressed into a tar file. So you will need to uncompress it into a folder that you will need to work with. So uh, let me see if I can show you an example. I am really sorry because I needed to work with um, an external drive to actually show everything to you. But unfortunately, I have a connection issue with my hub connecting it to my USB-C. So, okay, I'm going to quickly uh, show you the data files that are there supposed to be. Mm. Okay, so here you will see one observation data. So this will directly install the ODF only. So you will see this tar file uh, that you will have inside of it. So you need to just uncompress it within one uh, observe, let's say observation level uh, directory. 
uh, you will need all of the files in it with the files that were already uh, outside of it. So the most important part with uh, working with um, the um, XMM Newton SAS software is that it relies on how well your path is defined. So I will quickly go back to the, where is it? So here, as you, you will see that you need to define this path to all of your ODF files. So you will uh, have all of those files in one directory in which you will uh, have to define in your BashRC or ZSZ as HRC uh, in your computer. And then you will also need to define the uh, calibration files and ODF, uh, which I will explain a little in a little uh, further. So if you're done with uh, downloading your data, you can basically uncompress it and give the path uh, to your um, data files. And you can go on and start creating a calibration index file or CIF, which basically tells the software that you will have to um, select certain calibration files that are uh, designed for a specific period of time and that will be used for your observation that was done in that period of time. Uh, you will need to actually start with initializing Hailsoft and you need to start initializing SAS. And then you can go and create this CIF file. And you, when, once it's created, you can check if you are in the, in the right directory and if you have it created in the in the working directory. Once you see that it was created, you can add it to the CCF path, as you can see here on your BeshRC file again, and you have to source before uh, moving on with ODF ingest. Uh, so your terminal has to know that your BeshRC has been changed so that SAS can actually take all of these path information for the next step. So if you, after you've done this, I will actually add the, the step here as well. You will have to source your BeshRC again and then go along uh, with creating a summary file with all of the calibration files and all of the information for your observation. As you run those um, comments, you will see that it will be starting to list uh, a lot of observation and uh, a lot of different event files. And it will create all the I want like one specific uh, file that will be having a bunch of different characters in here and that will end like this. So once this is also created, you will add to add this to your SAS ODF file, which is going to be here. And then you will need to source your um, BeshRC again to let uh, your terminal know that the path information has been changed. And once these two, two things are done, you are basically ready for uh, by giving all of the information that the software needs to start preparing your observation files and creating event files for your uh, Epic PN and most cameras. And uh, from here on, you will start running EMPROC and EPPROC, which will take a while, especially for EPPROC, depending on your um, uh, specific computer. Uh, this will basically get all of the information that you provided with CIF and uh, this summary file, and it will process your event files depending on the information you've given it. So it, it is very important that you're working with um, an updated calibration database and you are working with the right paths. Otherwise, you will get uh, wrong event files from the very beginning. And I will give you a while for you to be able to run these things. And if you are not able to do certain steps, please let me know. And once you are done, please let us know on the chat so we can actually move on and uh, talk about filtering the event files for flaring background. 
And if you end up being very fast and you don't really need too much of an instruction, uh, you can basically go on and uh, do all these steps by yourself. But please be free. Feel free to actually reach out and ask if you have any questions. Otherwise, I will be just, you know, staring an empty screen thinking everyone is doing fine. Can I have just one question? Sure. Uh, the uh, save build is is saying to me that I need to export the SAS CCF path. Do you know which one it is? Uh, can you can you uh can you share me a screen so that I can see? Yeah. Oh, there's one. So sorry, no. I will kill you. <laughs> Okay. And uh, as you are sharing, Martin said uh, that there's no CCF, so you need to Can actually you see it okay. now. Uh huh. This this is what I mean. If you can see it. Yeah, yeah, I can. I can read it now. Um. Oh. Uh, can you open your BashRC file, please? Or if you're... I didn't put it there. I just exported it now in, in the terminal. Mm. Mm -hmm. But I have this set it up. Okay. Um, how did you define uh, the CCF in, in terminal? You mean this? Mm -hmm. uh, so, okay. like this oh uh did you define the odf path yes i did it was here all right um yeah so if i may i just just for you to see it would be better like this Yeah, so it's the files are here. Mm -hmm. so, uh, I, I think. Mm, okay, wait a second. I'm going to quickly see if there's some. Mm, uh, I see. So you have to uh, export your CCF, uh, the, not the the one that is going to be in your uh, linked to your ODF. So if I can just yeah, the CCF path probably needs to be separated. Yeah, yeah. So as uh, let me quickly see if I. Uh... I believe I already have these paths described. Um, so if you can go to the main page, the readme.md on GitHub and scroll down to where you have uh, all the paths to be defined, you will see that has to there has to be a, a set of other uh, paths defined, which also includes SAS CCF path. And then you will need to direct it to your CCF, not the one that you are creating. Now. Oh, here it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. And also, as to reply to Martin's question, and if you can stop sharing your screen so that I can. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah. I, I'm not really sure if. <laughs> you cannot get no, into I, it. Yeah. I can, need to. Can, I... you, can you probably. Uh, oh. I don't know where it is. Yeah, no, I I cannot. I just start. do it like this. Okay. Okay. So okay, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna quickly go back and show what what I am talking about for everyone. Yep. So as I uh, 
previously said that there is going to be a lot of paths to be defined and your software will look for those things in your bash rc file so if you can easily go and like you know add these things so these are just examples to what they normally would look like so you will need to change it for your own system and for your own data structure uh, what uh, Tomas was talking about, he was missing this. So you will, for uh, also to reply to Martin's question, um, for SAS, you need to have a different set of calibration files, which are called CCF files, and they have to be downloaded through this web page. And uh, hopefully it will load in time so that I can actually show you. You can either use uh, like a, access their FTP server and follow these comments, which are very easy to do and very fast. Uh, or you can basically sync with rsync uh, to a specific directory that you will have in your system. Um, and uh, then basically these are done within a few minutes. So if you are missing these files, that's why you are not going to see uh any ccf in your downloaded odf files and uh also you will also have receiving you will be receiving errors when you run uh the uh the gif build or cif build whatever that is called i always forget how they are actually pronounced so and in in this step you will not be able to finish it because you don't have CCF files. So you will need to go and download these uh, following these steps. If you have a problem, please let me know and I will give you some more time to actually run. If there's any problem, any other problems, please raise your hand, put it on the chat or basically start talking. I'm sorry, I yeah. was mistaken. Uh, the, the CCF I got, I have followed this uh, calibration specifics for Newton, mm -hmm. but uh, but I don't have this .cif. Oh, this this one? Yeah. Uh, so it will be created after you run this. Oh, okay, okay, okay. okay. So sorry. you will just yeah yeah no no problem. You will just uh, run all of these things and it will create these files like. Uh, ODF ingest or it will just create this and this GIF build will create this file for you. Thank you.
Oh. So for all right. <laughs> we now we are being recorded. Paused, so <laughs> I don't know why we have it paused. No, I, I think it's better because for the long pause, why do you have to need to record? Yeah, everything? because yeah, it was paused, but we forgot to switch it on. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So for uh I believe also for new star as well. Uh, the naming for the event files will always have some sort of e EVT event or uh, for cleaned events for Newstar, it will be a little different, but it will always have to be EVT for many of the uh, instruments. So if you can just specifically search for that EVT, it doesn't matter how, what the extension is. Uh, so it will always be the event file, but I will change it on the uh, GitHub mm -hmm. page as well. I think so those... I think hmm? in new star it is actually dot evt files. Uh, yeah, possibly. If I uh, yeah, I don't remember exactly the naming of it, but yeah, it's it's usually something pointing towards the event being yeah. it. So for these, as if you can, you know, look at the um the screenshot Martin sent us. Um so the the naming here is imaging. Because, like, for example, MOS1 also has the timing evts.ds uh, file. We will not be working with those. So if you want to go and uh, start renaming uh, these uh, for on these imaging events uh, in the way that I described on the uh, GitHub page, on the tutorial, mm -hmm. it will be a lot easier to work with because you, then you will not need to have to worry about um, like different observation ideas. For example, if I have to work with multiple uh, XMM Newton observations, then I need to change it all the time. And uh, the easier way is just to change these names from the beginning and copy and paste every uh, line without having to deal with it. too much of a change in uh, in general. So if you can just you know easily change these names and uh, then we will move on with uh, how to deal with the flaring background. Uh, are you done with your calibration files, Tomas? I have to say I'm not because I don't know why it has so many files. Oh, yeah, it will have a lot of files. <laughs> it's Imagine... still going. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it has. To... I had to done it overnight yesterday. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> because because uh, I started at around 8 until then it was so done. Oh all right. Oh, so I I think I've I've been yeah. uh, gifted with a speedy internet at the time I was downloaded these <laughs> things. Uh, so what it 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 has is basically is uh having calibration files from the beginning of the mission. So it's like imagine twenty years of yeah. Uh, I, I can everything. imagine, but it's like oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I hope I have enough space on my hard drive. <laughs> oh, uh, let me see how how. Large. I, I, I have I have six six hundred and thirty two gigabytes free, so I think I'm what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's working computer. Oh yeah. With one so, terabyte of data, so of disk, you know. So on mine, it's about say six point eight gigabytes. Yeah. So. And it's pretty fairly six, new, okay. so it should be around the same. 6.5, you say? So I will look how big the folder is now. Yeah, that might help. Uh, I have 6.7 now. I mean, mine is 6.79, so you should be near the end then. Yeah, I have 6.7, so... Looks oh, you are like, close. Looks like I will be close. Yeah. Oh, all right then. Um, you can immediately start working once you are downloaded. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, I will. That the uh, if you got the at least the logic behind. So I will quickly. Yeah, I uh... think I understand it from the GitHub and from Martin as he described it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so, I will... so just to... mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. Inter interrupt. It was it's nine gigabytes for me. Oh. Nine gigabytes oh. from yesterday. <laughs> All right, I so, I I downloaded mine on March. Uh, on March, so I think there must have been some and updates. And you you use the AirSync, right, Martin? 
Yeah, and I downloaded all of them. Yeah, so so the same as me. Okay. All right. So no I'm problem. like two it, gigabytes still... short now. Yeah, yeah, it's still pretty close. Um, Martin, yeah, if you I can. Think, I think it will be like 10, 15 minutes if I extrapolate. Yeah, yeah. So I will quickly show uh, what to do with the flaring background. Um, I will quickly show you. Wait a second so that I can load it. So once you end up like uh, extract a light curve from the event file you have uh, produced after running emproc and epproc, uh, you will have like uh, an uh, an observation averaged uh, light curve basically tells you like as I mentioned the the uh, XMM Newton has uh, thirty arc minutes of observing field of view. So you will end up with a light curve that basically sums up all of the events that you have uh, from that observation. And if you look at the um, uh, the tutorial, it will show you that the time bin size is 100, which means that each bin corresponds to 100 seconds. So it will tell you how many counts uh, was observed in a given a uh, hundred time, a hundred second bin. Um, so uh, for this specific uh, observation, okay, here you should be able to see, okay, I need to move things around. You should be able to see a similar light curve to this. And um, if you look at the rate expressions for MOS and PN, which means that it means like rate either smaller or equal to 0 0.35 for MOS and uh, 0 0.4 for PN means that it's like, um, it's a generic number for which you basically usually say, oh, okay, for MOS or PN, normally this value is this. It can sometimes be different for specific observation, Right now I'm showing you rate pn that fits file that I created for I believe it's the same observation as you are working with now. So you will see that there are a few jumps at the beginning and then you have a very flat for except for one bin. It might be just uh, like a one bin with a very large error bar. And then you have a bit of a decrease and then you have again, larger decreases. So what you want to work with is this steady state background, uh, steady state uh, event range. So these act probably correspond to either like a solar flare or a very large uh, flaring like a background object that you don't want to have to uh, deal with. So you will see that as I'm moving my cursor over here, you will see things change on the uh, left top where you have your x and y coordinates you will see that the y coordinate which corresponds to column is also changing for this specific observation instead of 0 0.4 you will have your steady observing time at 0. Point, uh, let's say 25 or 0. 0.2 would be a lot safer so which will mean oh no no maybe a little further let's say 0. 0.3 which will mean that your good time interval or your uh, best observing time will correspond to rates below this range. So you will be excluding anything that is above here. So your flaring background will be excluded over here. So basically that's what uh, the 
let me go back to the tutorial. So this is basically what is doing. So you have your table loaded into your software and you modify your rate expression differently for all of your uh, observations. For some of the observations, you will see your uh, this steady uh, observing time to be shifted by quite so far. So this is a different observation, for example, that you have very large uh, flares. But in our case, as you have seen, that those were very, very small and the, the steady uh, range actually corresponded to lower than you would normally have for uh, PM 0.4. So the, you, you will need to actually load each um, rate uh, tables and you will need to check for each MOS and PN as those are different instruments and they will have different and uh, different count ranges that you will be interested in. And then you will basically creating your uh, filter demand files after you um, basically extract your rate uh, table. And then you will have different selection expressions again for uh, PN and MOS. And uh, one way to distinguish instead of, you know, having it diff like having to memorize it is that you will see EM for epic MOS and you will see EP for epic PN. So it will be also present in other selection uh, expressions. And then you will have your uh, GTI file. So you also have to uh, change these as well, but I'm going to quickly change it in the file because uh, it's I, I, I need to actually update it. Mm -hmm. So here it's better to name them as just GTI instead of because I think the rest actually takes it as this way. So now it's updated in there. If you can refresh your page, you will see that now your uh, good time intervals, which will basically tell you that, okay, only take uh, time intervals where you have a steady uh, observing count rate, and then it will create your, um, how do you say it? Uh, a specific filtering uh, file that will only show you these time intervals. And then you will basically, when you run this, you will be producing this uh, epic clean fits. As, as I mentioned before, you will need to change this to MOS1, MOS2, or PN. And uh, it will be producing your clean filtered event file. And um, if you are interested in uh, analyzing uh, for very short time periods, like in terms of milliseconds, if you want to do some precise timing analysis, you have to go and uh, make a, apply a correction for like a baryocentric correction. So it is going to be shifting the exact uh, arrival of your photon to um, how it is detected. And uh, like at the... Um, according to the uh, the um, the center of mass of the solar solar system and uh, the position of the satellite so you will have a more precise timing analysis of your uh, observation this is uh, basically is done first you have to um, make sure that you still have your clean event file so it's going to be changing you like copying your initial clean file to this name which will tell you, okay, this is not applied. And and then you will run this task, uh, which will uh, apply this baryocentric correction so that you can work with the timing much precisely. And then if you, this step, as I mentioned, is not really that necessary if you don't want to use uh, exact arrival time of the photons, if you are not really interested in um, one second or one millisecond uh, light curves of your source, then you can skip this part, uh, but it's uh, it's a good exercise to do it yourself now. And uh, the next steps will be extracting an image. 
and uh, I I will not be waiting for you, Tomash. So you can basically do these things on your own. We will still have enough time. Yeah, of uh, course. But, but Martin, can you tell me when you are done, and then we can go and start with extracting the image. Oh, sorry, I my microphone was turned off. Ah, oh, no, no problem. Uh, just uh, okay, but just a quick question. It was the uh -huh. imaging events that I should use, right? Not the timing events. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for this specific yeah. exercise, mm -hmm. you can just use uh, imaging events. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So I'm going to give it a try.
I have a question, Anastasia. Mm -hmm. I will probably share my screen for you to Let see. Um, I already have the CCF zip file, mm -hmm. and it, and uh, when I run this, mm -hmm. sorry, yep. uh, you you will need to uh define the um the SAS CCF. Yeah, that, that's Again. I already I already have defined, but I just uh, had to export it back so that it, the odd fingers would work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I but I can export it again to where to see. Uh, CCF is so. Yeah, but well, I you can. Need to put... Yeah, and now I can I it... can export it. Yeah, to the. Mm -hmm. Yep. And when I run this, mm -hmm. you will find it, but he will tell me that there are no science files in the observation. Hmm. I don't know if that's correct, but it's... I don't think... No, no, it, it means that you need to... So uh, as I can see from your directory... Yeah. Uh... So you need to okay. You need you so you will see that there's this uh zero point six eight seven under score in your directory right now. There's another uh tar file in in red on yeah. the uh, on the right column. Yeah. So you you also need to uh untar that untar yeah. that one, that one maybe and. Put all of these things under one directory so that uh, these will not get confused for you at least uh, when you work with multiple directories. So you also have another um, observation data file downloaded. So if you move everything you have right now, uh, all of the ASC and um, like all of the untarred. Yep. I files into to one them. directory. Okay, so you will uh, now have to run the. Uh, you will need to reproduce the ccf dot cif because yeah, okay. now it needs. Okay, so it it needs to have uh, all of these information rewritten again, and then you will uh, redefine your path, and then you will need to run the odf ingest again. Okay, so I need to export it back. But... Mm -hmm. um... Yeah, because I have the ODF path set it firmly. Yeah, you need to remove wait. Maybe because the ODF path is uh, uh, yeah, pointing yeah. to the directory before. Yeah, yeah. You also that's why I, I said like if you can just simply move these things into your bash file and uh comment them out if you don't want to, you know, have yeah. them defined all the time. Because if you also had to, you know, uh, accidentally close your terminal and then it will. Basically... Yeah, I already have them. I did that. Did that, did that in the. I have it here, but the ODF path is set to the to the folder before the one mm -hmm. that I created. You know, so it's like I need to. Reiterate this.
Okay. Um, just give me a moment. A little bit of this, the other screen, so that you don't see how. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> you don't have to see everything. <laughs> no worries. I will not look. I mean, these are recorded. <laughs> then. I have the CCF file. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I need to do that. No. Um, this does. Okay. Uh, it should work, be working. No. Oh, yeah. Ooh. Why? Okay. But Still why isn't... is it no? Because it's again pointing in the wrong directory. But yes. But I mean, I. That's ODF. That's ODF path. I exported it mm -hmm. in there. So. Why? Export it again. 
and then run run the oh dear okay, yeah no it doesn't want me to mm. so you have all of these files under this directory you set odf there right um yes i have all of these in in the directory not in mm. the directory okay but i mean i can just make all of this disappear and do it in this folder <laughs> i mean you can give it a try or you can e simply restart your uh terminal from like uh, zero so that there's no um, confusion about directors and start, um, you know, redefining your paths again. Yeah. And I'm assuming you will also need to re-extract uh, re the uh, CIF file because yeah. I think it will also have to be uh, you think? corrected. Yeah. yeah. Um, because it, it, is, it, it is supposed to be looking for... Um, observation related files like uh the they call it housekeeping so it needs to find those specific observation files but uh the command itself does will not be giving you uh the error if it's not finding the correct ones because it's not it doesn't know if you are uh, giving it the right path uh, but when you run the odf ingest or whatever however they pronounce it um then it will look for a specific path and uh, a specific extension so that it will give you the uh, the error but the the first one will not actually produce any error if there's a problem okay. but just to be sure uh, rerun it again because it's not really that long it will give you it will only take a couple of seconds and then you'll be done again the same mistake I can't spell. <laughs> um, it should be all of them. Yeah, you need to initialize. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's running. It's a, it's again. I think it's running. No. Mm. No, but it's still pointing. I don't know why it is pointing to the Newton directory. Oh, uh, give give me a second. Um. I already I already even. Uh, Die. Um, wait, wait, wait. Go get back to the uh, just I think mm. no, I did, no, I, no, I, I, did, I even scratch it from here, you know. So, yeah, can you get back to the, the previous terminal? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me see. So, you have ODF, uh. Um, huh. um, interesting. Yeah, it is moment. very interesting. Just uh, um. So much fun. Well, I can I can always try to put those I mean, files. In yeah, the, in you the folder. Can, yeah, it's you can you can try doing that. Uh, in the meantime, can you send a screenshot 
this screenshot to me so that I can read carefully as you work through it. Um, mm. And maybe find a solution for you. You should have it in the Slack, my terminal. Okay. I'm going to quickly check what the problem is. Yep. Thank you. All right. Let's just. Um, you are sure that you're working in that directory, right? Yeah, I was working in the in the directory at the zero one four and etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's interesting because SAS seems to actually get that exact uh, directory. Like when you initialize SAS, you can actually see uh, all of the directories that are defined for it. So yeah. that you can you can basically check what's happening, and it seems that it is actually taking that ODF directory, ODF path, but yeah. somehow in there it's finding. It's not using it. Hmm. Yeah, but when I when I put it in the, in the Newton folder, it's running. It's even running the, now. Even okay. the yeah, but, but I did a mistake. So, uh, I need to export the CFF. CCF. Um... And you need to remove that uh, file from your directory because you created it before. What I need to, you know, it says uh, unexpected EOF in line, whatever, and uh, of ODF summary file, and then it gives you a path. You need to remove that because it was created in one of your attempts when you run. Yeah, I forgot ingest. to export the, the CCF again. No, no, you did. You did export the CCF. You just yeah, need but, to... but yeah, I ran the odd fingers before I exported, so I. You need to remove that. And, or... Yeah, okay, I will remove that file. Now try again. Yeah, it's going. Okay. Good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was going uh, even before, but I forgot to export the CCF, so I needed to stop it, and he probably mm -hmm. already uh, created the file. 
Okay, so now once this is done, you will need to export it again to the, yeah, SSS, to the... ODF and then uh, move on with the other tasks. Yeah. Um, EM I... prog and EP prog. I think that now I feel I will be okay. So I will stop sharing. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Martin, are you still there? <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I am. Yeah. But, okay, uh, good. We we didn't lose you. No, no. no. Uh, how is so it going well, for you? Uh, so, I had some troubles on the way, but I think I extracted the image. But oh, I perfect. was doing this. I was doing this for this PN. Uh -huh. So there is uh, only white dot on the back background. So I'm uh, not sure if this is. What What do you mean? So I'm not getting the picture that you shared. Oh, uh, uh, it's how... it's it's just a uh, an example. I don't think you you're supposed to be getting exact same image. Okay. Uh, can so... can you send me a screenshot of what you are seeing just to make sure? Yes. And I believe you are all also extracting LMCX4, right? Yes. All right. Okay. No problem. So that's only. Yeah. So the image that I put on GitHub, uh, the tutorial is uh, for LMCX3. I mean, it doesn't matter which uh, one you are doing right now. Uh, so the image for LMCX3 includes much many, like much more uh, point sources around. Uh, for LMCX4, it's more uh, focused. So you will only see one big blob of <laughs> ray of light in the image. So it's all right. Yeah, and and I had troubles to open it with the command. So I just run the DS9 and open it. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes uh, the file I created. Uh, are you using uh, Mac? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah it might. I forgot to uh, do the command uh, that you will be able to run it from command line. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. So the Im IMG display sometimes uh, gives some troubles to me as well. So that's why I added DS9. So with macOS, it's a, a bit of a pain in the butt. But yeah, DS9 should work. So I will quickly open one image from LMCX4 to show you what to do with that image uh, because it only gives you one point. Okay, I'm, I'm going to quickly share my screen. So this will also go for you as well, Tomas. Yep. So when you when you open uh, the saw image, let me move things around a little bit. You will see a very like a like a default set of settings that will show you one image. Like maybe sometimes you will not be even able to see this. So there are a few options as you will see here. First, go ahead and change the scale from linear to logarithmic. Then you will see that you have a different uh like you have more information coming from your source you can also zoom in and zoom out uh you can uh for mac users you can you, you can uh click on command and uh, drag your uh three fingers uh sorry so you can basically drag uh your three fingers in and out to change the color bar to show you exactly where the source is extending. You can also see the differences between uh, different scales. Sometimes it's for bright sources like this, it's better to use uh, some like either linear because then you will not have an overexposed um, pixels around your source. You can also have different color scales that might help you differentiate what the source is or what the background is. And if you are specifically looking for 
uh, where to choose your background selection, you need to make sure that you are not including any point sources so that you need to go back to your scale and go logarithmic and see if there are any other point sources. And as you can see from the first for shifting from the first image that you've seen to here, you can now see all of these point sources around your source. So you will see all of these dots. Uh, possibly some of them might be instrumental because as you can see that the source is quite bright. So what you need to do for this is that you need to go to edit and choose region that when you are clicking anywhere, it will produce a region and you will be able to drag it around. So what you have to do is now shift your scale back to linear and uh, actually see exactly where your source is. So now you zoom in, you make it smaller a little bit. This is only for observations uh, that you actually can see the uh, source that you are focused on. If you see the image like I put on the tutorial and you don't know which source uh, is your source, you will need to check um, exact locations. I'm not entirely sure. Can you see the uh, information on on the region or like, is it showing you any uh, coordinates right now or do I need to shift my sharing settings? I mean, we can see the region around the source. So you don't see the, okay, uh, let me quickly stop the share and uh, move things around a little bit because um, this part will need to show you. Mm. So now you should be able to see like the full uh, screen, right? Yeah, we can see. Perfect. That's what I want to show you. So if you double click on your circle here, you will get these informations. So this is your uh, coordinate of your source, and this will give you the information on your region. So you can see that I am choosing a 30 arc second uh, region size for this one. Uh, you can also see in arc minutes or other different uh, versions of it. For XMM Newton, what we will use as coordinates is if you go to physical, you will see that it shifted uh, your coordinates to the physical uh, coordinates that you will have on your image. So this will give you basically, okay, this is the center exactly on as, as observed on the chip. And if you go here, this will give you the exact si size that is recorded uh, on the chip. So these will be your numbers. If you go back to your, uh, I will need to put it back over here. So now we're looking at the, um, the tutorial. As you can see, I also gave you the uh, different uh, options. Here you will see uh... wait a second uh, I will need to add the uh... I will need to quickly add the, um, how is it called? This region information on it because I kind of now realize that I forgot, but no problem. I it will be very easy to do.
So here I am pasting, so this is PN. So I post I pasted it on the tutorial now for PN, but it will be the same for your uh, MOS extraction. So this is to show how the region is defined. So this will be your coordinates as you see here. So this will go here on your this will be your first and this will be your second axis. And this will be the size of your region, the physical size of your region as you find it here. So what you need to make sure is that these are all defined in a similar sense that you see in on the physical um, coordinates. So it will be the same here, but I will just you know quickly add it after I explain also the background selection. So you will need to note these things down somewhere uh, either on your laptop or your notebook however you want to do it and uh, then you will basically put this uh, selection expression into your expression here and then run uh, the comment as it is and as for the background for our specific observation i will go back to the logarithmic scale so that we know exactly what where the point sources are so what you will want to do is that you you want to have a background uh, as close as to your source because you will also have the exact like all, at least an approximate uh, background information around your source because if you go for example way uh, out in the outskirts then your point spread function will be different than it is for yours uh, your region here and you might end up with a different background information than it has to be for your source here. So what you want to do is to extract the background information that is also included in your source because you will also have, uh, you will still have some photons coming from the background. So you would need to move it around somewhere that you are sure that there's no other point sources. And some for some cases, for bright sources like this, uh, it's not really that big of a difference. You can say, uh, you can select the same size, you can change the size, but from, for my practice, at least I used to, I usually go for a larger background so that you can get as much photon counts as possible so that statistically it's a better representation of the background that you will be seeing from your source selection. And then what you end up doing is again, you select these sizes and uh, then put it in your background uh, information when you are extracting the back the same the comment line but you will only change uh, the name of your light curve over here uh, is there anything that is not clear i will yeah, yeah. Okay. Then I'm interpreting the uh, the silence in a good way. <laughs> so the the just like these uh, source selections and the background selections, uh, since MOS, Epic MOS, and Epic PN uh, are different uh, cameras, you will also need to make sure that your background, the value that you are putting here, is exactly the same corresponds to exactly the same location on your uh, detector for different detectors. So you need to check uh, and change these values for each uh, specific camera that you're working with so that you're capturing the exact position. I, I very recently made a mistake with uh, a similar issue that I ended up extracting a spectrum from somewhere completely different. Uh, so it still happens after years of using this instrument, but please make sure that you are actually checking all of these values for each observation, except for the sizes. The sizes will be the same, but the uh, exact positions has to be exactly the same, corresponding to the same uh, region that you are using. Maybe not for the background. Background should be still uh, approximately the same uh, if you just move it for like a, a few um pixels or something but for like small point sources like smaller points like for example this source 
it will be a lot different when you move it a couple of pixels over here. So please make sure. And uh, it will also go in the similar direction when you go and start extracting the uh, the spectrum for MOS and uh, PN. And uh, I think this is the only thing that I need to actually actively show you before we go and uh, start working with the timing mode. And also we will have uh, a break starting at 12. And uh, the break was intended for you to, you know, have a take, like take a break and have some lunch. Uh, but I will be around if you have any questions until two. With, uh, we will start the uh, afternoon session. If you have any questions in the meantime, we can easily discuss these things. And uh, if you have any errors, for example, if you have some catching up to do, uh, we can do those things in the meantime. So I think for today, I, I will leave you now uh, because the, these steps are fairly easy and uh, you can finish off these by yourself and uh, we will pick up from how to work with timing mode. And uh, it will be better if you can, I'm not pushing you, but if you have some time, uh, if you can do these things both for LMCX3 and LMCX4 before we start um, in the afternoon session, then we can be easily go on and uh, do some more signs with these. Do you have any questions? Uh, no. All right, then you know so where to. I have. Yeah, sure. Can I have one? Yeah, so yeah, sure. For for both sources, we should do the PN and the MOS one and two, right? Yeah. So for for, uh, for LMC X three, you will have only imaging uh, from both MOS one, MOS two, and PN. So you can continue with the imaging way for uh, LMCX3. But as you will see for LMCX4, there are different modes as you also shared uh, a screenshot that you saw that there was a timing mode. So uh, mm -hmm. then, then we will uh, continue with the timing mode in a different manner. So you, you can only extract imaging uh, one if you have the time, if you don't, then it's okay because it's still a lunch break for you. Uh, but it will be a good practice for you to do it by yourself and ask any questions if you have any. Okay. 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 Yeah. Then I'm stopping the share right now and I will see you at two. Yep. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, Thank you. okay see you soon then. See, see you soon. Bye. Bye.